Welcome to the forum at Holy Communion. If I don't know you, my name is Mike. I'm one of the priests here. We're continuing a series today called Bible 101. Uh, earlier in the series, the Reverend Mark Smith has talked about the parables, and the Reverend Lori Anzalotti talked about the book of Job. Today, I want to talk with you about the book of Exodus, and I want to talk specifically about the book of Exodus and liberation theology. The book of Exodus is the second book of the Bible. It's a foundational text, and it's a really important book, I would argue, for Christians, especially today. There's been a big discussion going on in theological worlds, in church worlds, for a while now about the future of the church. Uh, there's anxiety in this discussion. There's worry about what does it mean to be a church in places where the population of Christians is decreasing, when Christianity is less popular. And there's a way of looking at that argument that I find hopeful. It's a way of looking at the argument that says, okay, it's hard to measure, actually, uh, decline in the church. We don't know necessarily whether churches have less people on Sundays because there actually are less members overall, or whether churches have less people on Sundays because people just attend church a little less often. Still, there's anxiety in the system. But there's a discussion out there that gives me hope. And it says that we are in a new era as a church. And that for the past about 1500 years, the church has been allied with powerful political interests. Since the time of Constantine, uh, the church is, has been aligned with those in power. And the church has been the chaplaincy often uh, to the presidency or to the royal family. Uh, the church has played this official role. And that for the first time in this era, we're looking at what it meant to be a person of faith at the beginning of the church. We're looking at what does it mean to be a person of the faith when you can't just assume that you're in a Christian surrounding, when you can't just assume that faith is the perspective shared around you. What does it mean to have to claim your faith in that way? And I would argue that the book of Exodus is an important companion. And frankly, it's really new for someone like me, uh, someone who has white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heritage to have to think this way. The book of Exodus has been important for people of faith in this country for 400 years. Black liberation theologians will tell you that the black community in the United States, really the whole African diaspora that converted to Christianity, has been sitting with Moses and the Exodus for 400 years. More on that in a minute. Liberation theology is a relatively new idea or a relatively new phrase out there. It's, it's a movement that arises within uh, Black Protestant theologians in the United States and Latin American theologians roughly the same time, about the middle of the 20th century liberation theology gets started. Now, liberation theology also gets demonized uh, in the United States particularly, um, and by Pope John Paul II, there is such a push against communism, against Marxism, against socialism, against anything that could be identified with Marxist thought, and liberation theology gets lumped in. Uh, partly that is because in Latin America, the countries where liberation theology thrives, and particularly in El Salvador and Nicaragua, there are also popular uprisings. And the alignment of liberation theology with questioning economic power and economic um, forces meant that in the minds of certain political leaders in the Reagan administration and even Pope John Paul II, liberation theology should be gotten rid of, should be suppressed. It, it was identified with communism and with socialism. 
I think that does a disservice to liberation theology. Because liberation theology, while every once in a while it will lean into something that Karl Marx may have said about uh, economics and power, that's not its primary text. There are folks that criticize liberation theologians, particularly from Latin America, without, I think, reading what they actually have to say. If you read what they actually have to say, they quote a lot from the book of Exodus. They spend a lot of time with scripture and with Jesus. The critique has not been as present with U.S. Black liberation theology and womanist theology and queer liberation theology. And there's not been quite as easy of a economic dismissal or political dismissal of Black liberation theology. But it also has not gotten particularly popular outside of the Black church. So I want to spend a little bit of time with Exodus. I want to spend a little bit of a, t a little bit of time with this book that has been a resource for oppressed communities, uh, for folks who are asking, what does God have to say in the midst of our reality? Exodus could be defined really in three moves, and that's how I'm going to talk about it today. Uh, we're going to talk about the time before Moses, we're going to talk about Moses's rise to prominence as a leader and Moses's leading the people out of Egypt. And then we're going to talk about the rest of the book of Exodus. And that's an important piece that we're going to get to. Because I think most of the time when we think of Exodus, we just think about the first 15 chapters. Exodus, my seminary professor, Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, would tell you, the word in Hebrew means the way out. The way out. So if we're going to talk about the way out, we've got to talk about out from what? Out from what? And the answer is pretty easy. It's, it's Egypt. But let's talk about how we got there. The first chapter of Exodus begins with this um, genealogy that links Joseph to the people living in Egypt. And that is to say, in the time of Joseph, the people Israel make their way to Egypt. And first, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. It does not go well for a while for Joseph. He ends up in prison. But then Joseph makes his way to being the right hand of Pharaoh. Joseph makes his way into the household of the king of Egypt. And that's really good for his people. It's really good for those brothers because even though they sold him into slavery, Joseph chooses to save his brothers. A famine comes to the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, and Joseph's whole family makes their way to Egypt where Joseph has prepared Pharaoh and prepared the people of Egypt so that there is enough grain to share. So Joseph's people end up in Egypt. And then the drama of Exodus really begins. And about five verses into the first chapter, we hear this critical, critical line. A pharaoh arose in, is in Egypt who knew not Joseph. A pharaoh came to power who forgot the relationship. A pharaoh came into power who chose to ignore how these people had helped one another a pharaoh comes into power. And right away, you can start to hear resonances. Is this pharaoh gets suspicious. This pharaoh invites the other Egyptians to become suspicious of the people Israel. They treat them harshly. They treat them badly. And eventually, pharaoh says, you know, it's a problem. These people of Israel, they're having more babies than we are. They want to replace us. Sound familiar? We should do something about that. And Pharaoh starts a genocidal campaign to kill the Hebrew boys. And that's where the story of Exodus begins. 
Exodus is the way out, the way out of this broken relationship between the people and their ruler, this way out from this land where they have found themselves oppressed. Exodus is the way out. And the way out begins before Moses. The way out begins with some cunning women. There are two midwives, Shipra and Pua, and Pharaoh calls them to him and says, kill the boys. And the midwives walk away. And a while later, they come back to Pharaoh and they say, oh, Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like our women. They are vigorous and they give birth before we can get there. They lie to Pharaoh. They imagine a world where Pharaoh doesn't have the right to tell them what to do. They don't follow an illegal order and they push back. Moses is born. And what happens with Moses, except that his mother and his sister conspire to hide him from Pharaoh's persecution. They put him in a basket and float him down the river. And then a woman of Pharaoh's own household takes Moses out of the river, disobeys her father, and raises him. Genesis is the story at the beginning, the foundation of how God created the world. But Exodus is also a foundation story. Exodus is the story that tells us that God is a God that liberates us liberates us from oppression, liberates us from having to follow the unethical commands of leaders, and that God is there conspiring with unlikely characters. God is there conspiring with the women who start the revolution before Moses even comes up. So there's the beginning of Exodus. Moses is born into this, this inheritance of resistance, this inheritance of persistence. Moses is brought up in this vision that the world as it is does not have to be that way. And so along comes Moses. And Moses gets into some trouble. Uh, Moses ends up uh, reacting against a Hebrew taskmaster, uh, or a taskmaster over the Hebrews, an Egyptian taskmaster, he, he kills a guy um, who has been oppressing his people. And so Moses ends up on the run, and Moses has this encounter with God, where God says to Moses through a burning bush, I will be who I will be. My name is the one who is becoming. My name is I am. And he tells Moses, I have heard the cry of my people, so Moses, you go. And there's some back and forth, and Moses is nervous, but we come to that point in the story that has been told in so many movies. Moses goes to Pharaoh, and the plagues come, and there's the frogs, and there's the, um, the rivers as blood, and there's, there's awful stuff happens, and finally there's the Passover. And eventually, God's people are freed. And that's the part that we know. That's the part that gets told. This story of Moses, the charismatic leader. Moses, the one who is able to free his people with God's help. But it's interesting because even when they get to the other side of the Red Sea, even when they carried Joseph's bones back to the land of his ancestors, as scripture tells us they do, there are hints that God has ideas. Uh, when they get to the other side of the Red Sea, um, there's this song about how God has freed them. Moses' sister Miriam sings the morning after uh, the storm that that crushes the Egyptian army. The people have crossed through on dry land. This great miracle that God has done of giving a people the way out has been completed. 
And as the sun rises, the people sing. Miriam plays the tambourine and they realize that they have been set free. And we're at chapter 15 of a 40 chapter book. So we come to the third part of Exodus, which we know a little bit less about. That same professor I talked about, Judy Fentress Williams, liked to say that we treat Exodus as if it's only 15 chapters long, but it's quite a bit longer. The rest of Exodus is the rest of the way out. It's not over once they've escaped Pharaoh. It's not over once they've escaped Pharaoh. Those are some words we could use today. It's not over just because you've escaped Pharaoh. It, it turns out that for God, freedom isn't just freedom from oppression. For God, freedom isn't just freedom from the slave masters. For God, freedom isn't just from, it's for. We are not simply liberated from evil, from racism, from xenophobia, from homophobia or misogyny. We're liberated for something. And the rest of Exodus sends them in that direction. Exodus includes these famous stories of Moses climbing the mountain and coming back down with those you know, heavy tablets, with the Ten Commandments, with visions from God. At one point, Moses' face glows. And there are times when Moses goes up the mountain and down in the valley, the people are sinning. They famously create that golden calf. It, it takes a while for people who have been formed by oppression to learn to imagine a different way of being, to learn to imagine a different way of being God's people together. It takes time. They wander in the wilderness. It's a difficult part of the story, but it's an important part of the story. Because the God who liberates doesn't just liberate the people and set them free from the oppressor. God has an idea of the kind of people they will be. And, and some of that, a lot of that, has to do with worshiping God. There are a lot of chapters in Exodus that talk about the, the shape of the temple and the exact adornments of what it's going to be like when they build it, generations later when they build it. Uh, how you're to honor the ark, the, the carrying case for the uh, Ten Commandments, how you are to carry that. There's a lot, and it doesn't just, it goes beyond Exodus. And in, in the next books in the Torah, lots and lots of commands about how to honor God. And that's pretty critical. It's interesting, I think sometimes all of this law, and there's a lot of law in Exodus, but all of this law in the Hebrew Bible gets some criticism from Christianity. And some of that has to do with uh, the writings of Paul and the early church and the way in which they were interacting with law. A lot of it has to do with anti-Semitism. A lot of the critique of the Hebrew Bible and being this legalistic, um, say, a lot of it, honestly, it's anti-Semitism. There's really no other way around it. I, I don't think I quite understood this entirely um, until I had to have an interaction with our laws. Books of law are, are not something unique to the people of Israel. They're not unique to the Hebrew Bible. The legal tradition uh, is this big, thick, esoteric tradition. I, I can tell you, I, I grew up the son of a lawyer, and I remember the bookshelves in my dad's office and the bookshelves we had down in our basement that had big, huge textbooks, more than even my set of books that I've got here. A lot of them are from seminary. My dad had these big, thick textbooks that were boring. I mean, just the driest stuff you could possibly imagine. All of these cases, 
all of these precedents, all of these ways of interpreting the law that, oh my gosh, if you're not a legal scholar, are just the most boring thing you could ever read. But I remember I had an encounter with the law when I was in high school. I got caught for speeding. It was a surprise. Um, I got caught for speeding. And I had to go to court. And I don't know if it was because I was under a certain age, which is a possibility, or I, I can't remember why I had to go to court. But I had to go to court in order to answer for the speeding charge. And I remember that when we pled my case, the judge says, okay, this is your first offense. Um, so we're going to lower it. So you weren't speeding. You had a busted red or you had a busted rear tail light. And I thought to myself, what? And it was an appoint system in Colorado. And so if, if they had given me the ticket for the speeding, it would have been a lot of points and I might have, you know, my license might have been in jeopardy. And having a busted right tail light was a lot fewer points. So I, I should have just been grateful. And the fine was a lot less. So I should have just been grateful. But I thought, well, that's problematic. Like, what? I, there's nothing wrong with my tail lights. Like, how can they say I have a bad tail light? And my dad says, it's a legal fiction. Just accept it. But we can be critical about the Hebrew Bible. Um, and, and in that criticism is an anti-Semitism. To say that the Jewish people are a people of the law, they're a people, they're, they're legalistic, it's a, it's a terror, I mean, in that is an assumption. It's a bad religion, it's wrong, we know better as Christians, we've gotten past this legalism. And we ignore the way in which the Mosaic legal system forms the framework for our laws today. I, I wouldn't be one to advocate to have the Ten Commandments up in a courthouse because I think that usually that is Christians trying to assert that Christianity is the only way to look at things. But to a degree, I could understand why you might want to do that just from a legal perspective. Because the Bible is talking about law, and we have to remember that these are some of the earliest laws that are preserved. These are some of the earliest laws that we have preserved. And there is a sense in which these commands from God, not to bear false witness, not to murder, not to slander, that they formed a structure for a society where justice could be equitable. Having a legal framework for a society allows justice to be equitable. Now, in the history of this country, in the history of the world, we know that justice has hardly ever been administered equitably. But without the framework of law, there's no hope for equal justice. So be careful with the ways you think about all those laws in the Hebrew Bible. Because one, a lot of the Christian discussion about law in the Hebrew Bible comes from a place of anti-Semitism, comes from a place of saying Christianity is superior to that legalistic religion, which is problematic because without that legal tradition, we wouldn't have our own legal tradition. Yeah, there are some passages in, es in Exodus, there are some passages in uh, the Hebrew Bible that are pretty esoteric laws and your Jewish neighbor would tell you they get bored when they have to read those passages too. But in there is this hope. There is this faith that God has endowed people with inalienable rights. That God wants to treat God's people with fairness. And there's some really interesting commands in there. In the book of Exodus, among many places in the Bible, God tells God's people to welcome the immigrant because God says, remember, you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. Don't be like those Egyptians were to you. Treat immigrants hospitably, with fairness. Treat them as citizens. Welcome immigrants. In the book of Exodus, there are commands about if someone is in servitude, and it's a tricky translation. Uh, a lot of the Hebrew Bible talks about slavery. But there's a distinction that's made in Exodus. 
yes, the people Israel had slaves, they had servants, they exploited labor. But there's a really important distinction made in Exodus. You couldn't hold somebody in slavery their whole life. You couldn't own somebody their whole life. You couldn't own their labor. On the seventh year, the Jubilee year, you had to set them free. It's not a perfect world. Uh, this is one where, you know, if you talk about biblical inerrancy, if you, if you believe that uh, the Bible is meant to be this rule book for the way we live our lives today, you got to wrestle with how the Bible deals with slavery, because even after God's people are set free, God makes room for slavery. And we would say today, slavery in all situations is wrong. Slavery in all situations is wrong. The Bible makes provision for slavery. And this is why that we have this dynamic relationship with the text as Christians. There are all sorts of things that scripture um, instructs about or condemns that we have a different understanding of today from human sexuality to race relations to gender, and slavery is one of them. But even while it's endorsing slavery, it's making a distinction. The chattel slavery that Egypt practiced, this unrelenting ethnicity-based slavery that they encountered and they suffered under in Egypt wasn't permitted in Exodus. Exodus makes a distinction. Somebody can be bound in labor for a while, but not forever. The idea that human institutions can evolve to become more humane and hopefully we could eventually outgrow them. But it's there. There is this sense in Exodus that there are universal rights that no one can violate. There is a sense in Exodus that there is a baseline for humanity, a baseline for how we treat one another. Because God doesn't just lead the people out of Egypt. God is leading them to a new country, to a new way of being, to a new way of interacting with one another. This is where Christianity tends to pick up the narrative a little bit. And liberation theologians in particular tend to pick up the narrative a little bit. Uh, Christians have a hard time reading Exodus without also going to Jesus because there's a certain resonance. It turns out that the God of Moses is the same God for us as the God of Jesus. Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, likes to talk about the loving, life-giving, liberating God, all the same God, the God of Genesis who gave life, the God of Jesus who is love, is the God of Moses who is a liberator of God's people. Jesus preached a vision. More than anything else, Jesus talked about what has been translated as the kingdom of God, most often. In Spanish, it's the reign of God, reino de Dios. Uh, it's also been called by modern liberation theologians, the kingdom, drop the G, uh, we're all kin, the kingdom of God or the commonwealth of God. But Jesus preached a vision for the world as it could be. Jesus preached a vision for the way that we can treat one another. Dr. King translated that idea of the kingdom of God and Dr. King called it the beloved community. Liberation theologians would say that the book of Exodus points us in the direction that is not just away from Pharaoh, not just away from oppression, but toward justice, toward freedom, toward human rights, toward flourishing together in community. And I was thinking about it, there's, there's a shift that seems to happen in the book of Exodus. I need to do some more research on this shift, but I was noticing it as I was going through preparing for today, and I want to offer it to you as a place to close. The book of Genesis God interacts a lot with individuals, with Adam and Eve, with Abraham and Sarah. God makes promises to individuals. 
and says to Abraham, look up at the stars. Your descendants will be like the stars. But by the time we get to Exodus, God's promise is not so much individual as for the people. God liberates not just Moses, God sends Moses to liberate the people whose cries God has heard. And God promises not just one person, but a people. This vision for how the world could be, God gives them freedom to be in community, to be a people together. In Sinai, the covenant comes. All of the people get together and God's voice is heard and God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Exodus teaches us that we aren't saved alone. We're not in this alone. We're not in this just for ourselves. Salvation is not just a me and God prospect. It's about all of us. And we can't have salvation if we're leaving our neighbor out of it. We can't have salvation if we're leaving the immigrant, the impoverished women, queer folk. We, we can't have salvation if we're leaving folks out. There's a reason why this narrative has resonated so much with liberation theologians. It's obvious on one level, this is the story about the God that sets people free from oppression. And as Archbishop Desmond Tutu liked to say, you know, the missionaries came with the colonizers to South Africa. The missionaries came with the colonizers to Latin America. The missionaries came and they gave people the Bible. And Desmond Tutu says he could never really understand their reasoning on that because the last thing you want an oppressed person to have is a Bible because it's a roadmap to freedom. But that freedom is not just freedom from oppression. That freedom is a freedom that we exercise to make sure that our neighbors are also free from oppression. God's way out isn't a narrow way for just a few people. God's way out is the wide path through the turbulent sea. There is a wideness to God's mercy. Moses says, let my people go. This story of Exodus is a foundational story, a foundational story for teaching us about the kind of God it is that we are asked to worship. The book of Exodus is a foundational story for understanding who this God that Jesus preached about was. This God is a God that sets God's people free. Jesus would have read Exodus with a particular ear living under Rome's oppression. Folks who lived through chattel slavery in the United States, racial slavery in the United States, listened to this story with a particular ear. There's a reason that story, Let My People Go, became a spiritual. And as Christians ask, in this time, what we have to offer, the book of Exodus can be a resource for us. Because it's not just about what you do once you get free from Egypt. The book of Exodus asks a bigger commitment. It asks us to live in the world as God would have us live, taking care of the poor, the immigrant, the orphan, listening to the example of persistent, resistant women, and seeking always to live in freedom for our neighbor. Thanks for taking some time with me to look at the book of Exodus. I hope it becomes one of your favorite books in the Bible too.